All right, hello everyone. Welcome to the Rural Grocery Succession Planning webinar series. We're gonna give folks just another minute or so to join. Um, but while we wait, uh, feel free to let us know in the chat where you are logging in from and what is your connection to rural grocery. Um, when you do that, make sure you're hitting send to everyone so that um, you're not just in sending it to the panelists. So we're going to start in just one more minute, but let us know in the chat where you're logging in from and what is your connection to Rural Grocery. All right, let's go ahead and get started. Um, welcome to the Rural Grocery Succession Planning webinar series. My name is Erica Blair. I'm a program manager for the Rural Grocery Initiative, and we are a unit within K-State Research and Extension. And we work with communities all across Kansas and the nation to support locally owned rural grocery stores. Um, thank you all for joining us today. In this webinar, we are going to be discussing various examples of community-supported grocery stores, and we have three case studies to share with you today. Next slide. First, I just wanted to give a quick overview of the webinar series. Um, so this is a continuation of the webinars that we hosted in 2021 called Keeping Groceries Alive. So if you are looking for additional resources related to succession planning, you can go ahead and check out that webinar series. Um, you can find those videos at ruralgrocery.org. This webinar series that we have been hosting throughout 2022 um, has highlighted various resource providers who can help you through this process. Um, we have identified key succession planning considerations, um, and because every business transition is different, we've also featured a real world example to learn from in each webinar as well. Um, and, and this series has been hosted roughly every month throughout 2022. So again, to find those additional resources on this topic and those um, additional videos, you can find those at ruralgrocery.org. We want to take a minute to thank our sponsor, the Ewing Marion Kaufman Foundation for making this webinar series possible. And finally, I just have a few housekeeping items. So this webinar is being recorded. Again, you can find those recordings at ruralgrocery.org under the events tab. And we will also have time at the end for Q&A. So if you have any questions or comments during the presentations, um, feel free to share them in the chat box or the Q&A box. I will be monitor monitoring those, and then we will have time at the end to address those questions. So with that, um, we are ready to get started. So again, today's topic is community-supported groceries. Business transitions often present opportunities to think outside the box and partner with community stakeholders. So in this webinar, we are featuring three distinct case studies of rural Kansas communities that created innovative solutions to establish or retain their local grocery store. So today we are joined by Amy Oltman, who will be discussing a school-run grocery store, Jeannie Roberts, who will be discussing a nonprofit grocery store, and Taryn Carmichael, who will be discussing a public-private partnership um, so our presenters will be sharing how these ownership models work, what are what was their process for establishing these stores, and what are some pros and cons that they've experienced as well. So with that, I am going to go ahead and turn it over now to our very first presenter, Amy Oltman, with the Blue Stem um, USD 205 and Blue Stem Mercantile. 
Good afternoon. Um, thank you for allowing me to present today. I am Amy Oltman and I, my daytime job or my real job is a special education teacher for Blue Stem School Districts. And our um, community is located in um, Butler County. It's in the South Central part of town. We can just go ahead and switch slides. There we go. And um, our population is about 667 people. And our town uh, has like a cafe and a, a Fleming's feed store, but we had no grocery store for about two years. And our school district um, felt the need to have a downtown presence and like on our main street. And um, we wanted to help our local community have a grocery store since we did not have that. So next slide. Um, our issue was our grocery store, the only other place was about um, 10 miles to the east and it was on a major highway. So parents didn't want their kids, their young kids driving on the busy highway to get there. And, um, the other town, El Dorado, it was um, about 15 to 20 minutes away. And um, the community members were like, we need milk and eggs and we would like fresh beef. And we didn't have a way to meet those needs. So um, our superintendent decided that this was a job for us. So um, we also, if you can go one more slide previous, sorry. Um, my special ed students uh, had a problem with, um, they did fine through high school, but they didn't know what to do after high school. And they were lacking the skills for like going to work at a Dollar General or a Dollar Tree or a Walmart. And we just didn't have those life skills. So that's where I came into play. And both our elementary and high school had products, but they didn't have a place to display them or the products to, and produce to sell at a location. So that's when our um, superintendent, um, Joel Lovesy, came up with a solution. And he, um, we started the store downtown and the elementary and the high school had places to display their products. And then we put in some, a small grocery store and we added local vendors to have the Blue Stem Mercantile. Next slide. And this is our store. Um, so our solution to our problem was the Blue Stem Mercantile uh, or Blue Stem Elementary had a greenhouse um, since 2003, and they just sold their products such as their um, their vegetable starters, their um, all kinds of fruits, and they just sold it out of the greenhouse. And they had one day that everybody could come in, and then a teacher would have to stay out in the greenhouse and sell if anybody was late comers. Then um, our students started canning our salsa and we just had eggs and surplus that they would have to come to the school for. And then our flowers and our beef that's raised at the school, we just like sold it in a raffle. So that was very hard to um, like to have a central location. And when the Blue Stem Mercantile came, this was a perfect because we sell all of our salsa and our eggs and our flowers and um, our beef down at the store. So um, that helps a bunch. So that's the elementary part of it. And the high school is on the next slide. Our graphic design, they're in charge of making um, like our branding for our sto store. So they made all of our branding for their candles and our jellies. 
and um, they get a kickback with that. And they also get other jobs from people coming in and um, finding our designs on our products also. And then we have like a, a sheet of paper, like a requisition that the um, like customers can fill out if they would like the graphic art design class to customize something for them. Um, our shop class makes beautiful cutting boards and cornhole boards, and um, they have now generated enough money to start a wood shop, um, like after school program. Our National Honor Society um, do special things like cake pops at Valentine's Day. My class has learned how to put um, like rose bouquets for Valentine's Day. We have sold a ton of those and um, we come up with Valentine's Day and Father's Day gifts. And we have now our own candle line that we've designed. And so it's just been really fun to see what we can offer. Um, our graphic de design class has made our t-shirts and our aprons and our license plates and anything that comes in from the community that um, they would like to personalize for their own for themselves. Um, our video production class is in charge of making the commercials like the one that you've seen before and um, they uh, are the, the, the commercials and the videos they can make and put them on Facebook for any other private entity that is fit for a school environment. So next slide. These are just some pictures of um, one of my students in the top left. Um, he designed the the logo for his li large night crawlers. So he sells live um, night crawlers for bait in a store and we have in the springtime a lot of customers supporting him and the orange marmalade uh, this is an example of a design that our uh, graphic design class did and then um, the wood shop you can see that we have different items made from them and they do a lot of refurbishing for people and then we have local vegetables and um fruits from a local farmer that brings those into us. And then um, in the top right, you can see where our wood shop and what they provide. And then the Christmas trees and the signs are just an example of some of the vendors that um, want to sell locally at our store. Next slide. The pros, um, it benefits the school by having life skills working business with the safety net of the school because we're a nonprofit, the school is. Um, we have tons of people that want to be vendors and we have a lot of community involvement because we have so many people that are tied into the store. Our most challenging um, thing is losing students that go on to different jobs or another community. So that's the hardest part for us. Next slide. Um, what's next for us? Um, my students and I are hosting this Saturday a Home for the Holidays Shopping Expo where we invite, we had so many um, vendors that wanted to come to our store. We just invited them for a one day, come and enjoy a craft fair and my students will be serving them and our store will be selling. We outgrew the mercantile, so we're having it at our elementary gym and um, we have almost 30 vendors that are coming to share with us that day. Um, we are going to install real shelving. So we're super excited about that. And um, over Christmas break, I believe we're putting in a commercial kitchen for my students to learn um, culinary skills. Next slide. Um, our next presenter is Jeannie Roberts and she is, um, a nonprofit grocery, and she has is working with Grand Avenue Market, and she's the president of the Community Enhancement Foundation of Plains. Hello. Um, can we go to the next slide? Um, Plains is in Meade County. The population of our zip code is 1,515. Um, we actually service both Plains and Kismet, so our actual service area is a little over 2,000 people. Um, our grocery store closed in 2001, and we worked for 13 years, starting in 2008, 9, to bring a grocery store back to Plains. Um, 
we opened December 8th of 2021. So we haven't been open quite a year yet. Um, next side, slide, please. Um, like I said, the store closed in 2001. And when that happened, we had a convenience store and a lot of our um, community people became dependent on the convenience store. And with this dependence came unhealthy eating habits. Um, because we lost the grocery store, we've lost other businesses indirectly due to that. Um, we've had increasing difficulty to attract new people to Plains um, since we are without such a basic um, amenity as convenient access to nutritious food items at affordable prices. Um, Plains is actually lo located on Highway 54 between Liberal and Mead, and both Liberal and Mead have grocery stores, but um, to travel there, it's a two lane highway and it's one of the heaviest truck traveled highways in Kansas. So we wanted to try to keep our, our people in town. Next slide. Um, we ended up forming a foundation and we incorporated and became a 501c3 charitable organization. We um, investigated many different fits for planes but the nonprofit was the best fit. Um, the Grand Avenue market is owned by the foundation and um, the manager is hired by the foundation and, may, and she answers to the board members. Then the manager oversees the daily operations of the store. Um, but we had a stumbling block that we didn't, um, we didn't have an available building anymore to put the grocery store in. The store building was sold to a church and now you were using it as their gathering place. So our only option was to build. And um, so when we found, formed this foundation, I'm sorry, um, we had to work with a lawyer and it took us a year to get actual 501c3 status. Um, that's our grand opening, December 8th of 2021. Next slide, slide, please. And that's the front of our grocery store. It was a great addition um, to our downtown planes. Um, next, next one. Um, the partners that were involved, of course, the city council is the one that originally formed us as just a committee. Um, Eventually we formed a foundation, incorporated, and then applied for 501c3 status. Um, we worked with, I missed one. Um, the first people person I called was Marcy Penner with the Sampler Foundation, and she led us to David Proctor with K-State. Um, Southern Pioneer got involved and um, they gave us grants, plus they also helped to write grants for us. Um, the Sunflower Foundation out of Topeka gave us um, two different grants and um, the Kansas Healthy Food, Fit, Food Initiative, um, Mead County Economic, Economic Development, Wholesale Foods, Associated Wholesale Grocers in Oklahoma City, Tri-State Bank and IFF. Next slide, please. Um, our store is located in the heart of downtown Plains. Um, it has become a social hub for the community. Um, we located it in downtown instead of on the highway for the mere fact that um, Highway 54 is an extremely dangerous highway. Plus Plains has 23 on the average, 23 trains that go through daily. And in order to get to the highway, you have to cross the railroad tracks. And that was putting our kids, we felt in too much danger and the community didn't want it out on the highway. So we went ahead and put it in the heart of downtown Plains. Um, by having the grocery store in, in town, um, it saves much travel time and that translates into family time. 
Um, a commercial kitchen is part of our, our store footprint and we have all the equipment. We just don't have the hood installed yet because we did run out of funds. So next slide, please. Um, this is the fundraising as much as I could um, remember. I'm pretty sure I've got everybody down here. Um, State Farm Cause and Effect Grant is now called Neighborhood something. <laughs> Southern Pioneer Electric actually gave us two grants, plus um, wrote the grant for us for um, our USDA loan grant. Um, Sunflower Foundation gave us a planning grant and then an implementation grant. Uh, Mead County Economic Development has given us money. Um, we have won the community, Kansas Community Tax Credits twice. Um, Southwest Kansas Community Foundation out of Dodge gave us funds. Um, Kansas Healthy Food Initiative gave us a grant. And they, um, Kansas Healthy Food Initiative is actually um, partnered with IFF. And so they led us to IFF and that's who we got a loan from was IFF. Um, we got many individual donations and we conducted many fu multiple fundraisers. Um, next slide. Um, being a 501c3, this was one of the biggest reasons we qualified for more grants. And for the people that are donating, their tax, their donations are tax exempt. Um, and like I said earlier, a challenge was getting the 501c3 status. It took a full year. And it's also very difficult to find a lawyer that specializes in 501c3s. Um, and the lawyer that we've been working with is on her way to retire in here pretty quick. So um, next slide. Um, we've had lots of growing pains, but we do have a network of people that we can call to for help. Um, other grocers, we've got associated wholesale grocers. We've contacted K-State as needed. Um, we have some really good employees, but good employees are really difficult to find. Um, it seems that what people are telling us that work ethics have changed since COVID has hit. Um, for us, we're still working to bring the entire vision for Grand Avenue Market to reality. Um, we're wanting to make uh, get the final piece for the commercial kitchen in place. Um, we plan to do um, healthy eating snacking classes. Our main goal in the very beginning was to have the commercial kitchen so that Spoilage and shrinkage is a major problem with grocery stores. And we thought we could use the commercial kitchen to make soon to expire items into food, food that we could in turn sell to our customers. Um, then we were gonna do cooking classes. And I don't know if you've ever heard of like Dish It or Dream Dinners. Um, the store does all the prep work and customers come in at a certain scheduled time and they can put together meals to take home for that night or to freeze for later. Um, I believe uh, the other thing that we want to do is um, we, need, we need the paved, a paved lane for the truck and parking at least gravel for the employees. So that's our next two projects is get the commercial kitchen up and going and finish the parking area. So um, our next speaker is Taryn Kymar Carmichael. She's with Bird City Century 2 Development Foundation and um, they've partnered with a private citizen for their grocery store. Hello, thank you, uh, Jeannie. Um, like she said, my name is Taryn Carmichael. I'm the executive director of Bird City Century 2 Development Foundation. Uh, next slide, please. Bird City is located in the far northwest corner of Kansas. We have a population of about 450 people um, here in our small town. 
And unfortunately, we lost our grocery store um, in the early 2000s uh, for a period of time, approximately about a year, maybe like 15 months um, when that happened. Uh, next slide, please. So we have kind of a unique setup. We've actually had um, quite a few communities reach out to us just to see how we're doing things um, out here. A little history um, on how our you know, grocery store in our community came to be what it is now. Um, before, like in early 2000s and before, our grocery store was privately owned by families um, that lived here. And then as, you know, succession planning, they just kept, you know, handing it off family to family. Um, then there came a time, obviously, where we lost our grocery store. And during that time, we had a local banker who ended up buying the grocery store. Uh, he was an older gentleman, um, like late 60s, early 70s when this happened. And so he got tired of driving. The nearest grocery store is about 20 miles or 15 miles away from us. And he got tired of driving to get necessities. So he purchased the store. And um, the side note like on that is the local banker was also one of our founding fathers of our foundation for Bird City Century 2 Development Foundation. And so he kind of tied the two together because he saw how important, um, you know, if you look at a community and your focal points within the community, a grocery store is one, um, you know, all the businesses that you have, but your grocery store and your school are like two of the main focal points in a community. And so he tied the grocery store in with the foundation. And that's kind of how we we got involved um, as a foundation um, in order of a working partnership. And so upon his passing, which was in 2006, um, the grocery store was actually gifted over to the foundation. And since then, the foundation has worked with local individuals um, to keep the grocery store up and running. Uh, some of, like I said, some of the issues and challenges that our community was facing was we had to travel to neighboring towns to just get the basic necessities. Um, but we needed to find a way to stabilize and support for the store to remain open and continue operating. Because what we were finding is it was just so hard, you know, already to get your foot in the door. Um, but then once you got your foot in the door to continue operating, uh, if it was like a local individual. So our goal as a foundation was to support that endeavor of, you know, whoever it may be, an individual or a family that wanted to run that, um, creating a working partnership to make sure that happens. Um, and as well, like one of the challenges that we faced back then, we still face to this day, even though we have people, um, great people that are in there currently and doing a fantastic job with our store is succession planning because, um, being in a small town, we already have, you know, limited businesses and what we have, we want to keep. And so um, we're always looking 5, 10, 15 years down the road. Uh, next slide, please. These are a couple of photos um, from our grocery store. Uh, we're very fortunate when the foundation took over the grocery store in mid 2000s, we actually did a full um, renovation on almost all of the freezer and refrigerator um, spaces, except for our dairy, like meat and dairy um, coolers. Those are the original, but uh, new flooring, like all of that kind of stuff. We did a whole renovation when we took over um, our grocery store. And uh, next slide, please, sorry. So what we came up with was, um, when we were gifted the store, how, how we're structured here is our foundation owns our grocery store. And with the foundation owning the grocery store, the idea is that it ensured that our community would always have an open and operating grocery store. Um, basically, the partners involved in this were, you know, the foundation um, and our real estate fund, which uh, under our foundation, I kind of use the umbrella um, deal, but uh, we have set up a local, like a Bird City Real Estate Fund LLC, which holds all of our real estate within that fund, um, which is what our uh, grocery store is held in. So with that, um, we funnel everything real estate through that, and it kind of keeps it clean because it is a for-profit entity. I should have said that earlier, but um, 
our grocery store, how it stays connected to the community is it's the center point of our community. Um, literally, it sets right smack dab in the middle of our main street. It provides healthy food options, uh, you know, for our community and surrounding area. Um, we are actually very fortunate. We have a very nice grocery store that pulls from probably a 60 mile radius um, because we have things here that a, a Walmart doesn't carry. Um, so we have people traveling um, up here to do their grocery shopping, which is kind of cool. Um, uh, it, our grocery store obviously works with local businesses, restaurants um, to either provide like if they're, you know, beef or, uh, you know, vegetables or whatever it is, you know, the grocery store will help sell that. Or, you know, if it's a restaurant, um, that restaurant will buy goods from our grocery store. Um, also here, like within the past couple of years, they've kind of dabbled in catering. So every day they either cater events or they um, do lunch every day that you can go in and you can grab a hot meal there. And they have like a little setup in the back where you can uh, enjoy lunch for the day with, you know, enjoy each other's company. Uh, next slide, please. So again, like how it's operating, who makes decisions. So it's owned um, by Bird City Real Estate Fund or the foundation. And the store um, currently is operated by Chris and Andrea Thompson. They're a young couple that lives in uh, our community. Chris and Andrea actually got uh, the privilege of speaking on one of these forums here a couple months ago. And how it works is the foundation wants nothing to do with the day-to-day -day responsibilities of running the business of a grocery store. So we own the physical structure um, and how I look at it and like the equipment inside. And then we rent it to uh, Chris and Andrea to operate the grocery business out of. Um, the steps that we did, obviously we accepted the gift um, upon the passing um, of the local banker. And then we moved that property into our real estate fund, which again, functions as a for-profit entity. Um, we've done inspections and, on the property and equipment that happens probably about every, I'd say three to five years around there, depending on, um, but it gets a review every single year. We do walkthroughs over there. Um, and then we have a structured, you know, lease agreement. Uh, so basically Chris and Andrea as tenants, they pay a monthly rent. Um, how we have it set up is tenants are responsible to uh, pay for the utilities over there. If something goes down, um, like if a cooler or something like that goes down, we have like a thousand dollar hold. So um, they pay anything up to a thousand dollars, anything over the foundation um, takes on that uh, cost and we cover that. Taxes are all covered um, on the foundation as far as property taxes and the taxes on equipment, um, we take care of that. And repairs, um, alterations, modifications, anything like that, we're pretty open. Um, actually, Chris and Andrew are a very ambitious couple. They have a lot of um, things on the burner that they're working on and um, some they've already implemented, which is great. Um, with those kinds of things, we just have a constant line of communication and some things we help out financially, depending on what it is. Um, other things, we just green light them if they want to uh, implement something new within the store. Um, insurance, they carry their own insurance, but we obviously carry insurance on the store as well. And then examination of uh, premises, we always have walkthroughs um, about once a year uh, just to identify um, any updates that need to be done or just think, you know, making that continuous list because with equipment, you're always up against something <laughs> uh, that's probably going to run out. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, pros and cons. So what's most beneficial about this grocery model? I think what we found is most beneficial is it, it shares the burden of costs and operating. It allows um, our community to continue, continue having a grocery store. Um, but it, it makes it to where it's bearable for the person that owns the grocery store to, to make a living and want to continue doing that. Um, and hopefully there's, you know, um, very little sign of like burnout because we try to work together on that. I know some it's not easy operating a grocery store at all. 
Um, but when we can take on some of the cost and of, you know, like the building and paying for taxes um, and everything, I, I definitely think that that helps out uh, in that. Also uh, brings new and healthy food uh, lifestyles to the community. Um, our grocery store has had the opportunity of doing like Simply Produce, which is through uh, our Kansas State um, Extension um, office. Uh, they come in and it's like a 15 pounds of produce for like $15 uh, kind of deal. And so they bring in um, different programs and stuff for our community. And then honestly, again, creating and supporting an economic structure that supports our community um, by supporting our you know, grocery store in the way that they are, they're able to support our businesses um, and other organizations within our community even better. Um, one of the most challenging things that we found out with this grocery model. So here recently, we're actually looking at having to update um, some of our coolers because we've just had some issues just due to age and everything. They've been the original um, coolers since we've moved in. And because we have split where the foundation owns the property, but the um, tenants are paying for all the utilities, that's taking us out of the running on obtaining some grants or getting into some programs for financial assistance on those things. Um, so we're we're currently kind of reevaluating to see how um, we can either work together so we we are eligible for those kinds of things to obtain those funds. But um, that's been one hurdle, like recently that we have ran across um, that has been given us some grief. Uh, next slide, please. So what's next? Um, a lot of growth and learning still. <laughs> uh, you can see some of the pictures uh, here this past year. Our grocery store actually opened up a little coffee bar in the back part, and it has taken off. It's a hometown perk is what it's called. They do fresh donuts Mondays and Saturdays and everything, but you can come in um, Monday through Saturday, 7 a.m. to 2 p.m., and you can get yourself a cup of coffee or um a smoothie or whatever, you know, your choices. And uh, they're constantly looking at, you know, what's the next big thing, adding a deli, um, a bakery, that sort of thing uh, to it. So um, for us as a foundation, it would just be, you know, trying to find ways to support those to grow that because we're looking at it as, you know, yes, it's helping them, but it's also helping our community. They employ quite a few people. Um, they actually employ part-time about five students that we have here um, in our community, which is fantastic um, to see them when you walk in working. Um, again, what's next for our store? We're looking at updating freezers and coolers for more efficiency. Uh, we're trying to get our foot in the door. We're working with them right now to get involved in the WIC program. That's something that has been a challenge for us because we found out that we're losing a lot of uh, families to again, other communities because uh, we can't take WIC right now. And so that's been something that's been um, in the works of trying to get that involved into our um, grocery store there. And then again, discussion of expansion, like I mentioned earlier, a deli, a bakery, um, that's just been something that we have been discussing here recently um, about how that looks and, you know, five, 10, 15 years from now and how, you know, we can help be a part of that. Uh, Next slide. Okay. Awesome. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Taryn and Jeannie and Amy. Um, great case studies of ways that rural communities can be creative to uh, establish or retain their local grocery store. Um, so we do have time now for some questions. If you have questions, feel free to put them in the chat um, or in the Q&A box. And we will have some time now at the end of the webinar to address those questions. And if Jeannie and Amy and Taryn, if you wanna turn your videos back on, um, we will just have a, a conversation here. So I guess I wanted to start, uh, start off with asking a question for Taryn. Um, since your story is fresh in our minds, <laughs> um, I, I'm wondering, kind of tying it back to, you know, this, uh, this 
theme of succession planning when the current owners are ready to retire. And I know that's kind of a, a ways off because it's a young couple that's currently at the store or whenever they're ready to exit the business, right? How do you see this ownership model affecting the grocery store's succession plan? Um, and how do you think the community foundation might get involved at that point? Yeah, so that's a great question. I think, uh, and hopefully I can answer it. <laughs> um, I think at this point in time, so we, we've been very, very fortunate that we have not, um, we've only had two owners. So when the foundation first took it over, uh, the lady um, that took it over from 2006 up until 2020, we were very fortunate. I mean, she ran the grocery store for over 10 years here. And when it came to, you know, her, she approached us about, you know, talking about, I think I'm getting ready. You know, I want to retire. She has grandkids, that sort of thing. Um, she gave us ample heads up and it's, it's kind of a whole, it's a teamwork thing when it comes to that. Cause she realized how important it is, you know, and she built that business up. Um, we're just able to offer the structure for her to operate out of. And so with her, we kind of, join together on the succession planning because it's really her that sells the business, you know, and can pull someone on that can can talk that lingo when it comes to succession planning because we don't know the first thing about <laughs> operating a grocery store or anything like that. So it's kind of a teamwork in progress. And what sold uh, Chris and Andrea to a certain extent was the fact that we do help, um, you know, like they're, um, we keep the rent fair but it's low and like starting out you know with them we have the ability um to make it lower just to get them on their feet and everything within the first three years and so and, and kind of work with that to make sure that they're stable and so i think with whoever comes next that's going to be a benefit to them um and we're very fortunate you know as a community to be in a position to be able to offer things like that um and basically you know buy time to help people get their feet under them and um, start operating to where, you know, they're finding success because it's not easy, um, that transition of power from one person to the other and carrying on because, you know, you have different ideas and everything. And so that just takes time. And so we're able to kind of take some burden off by, you know, owning the grocery store. So if anything happens to the physical structure, that's on us, like as the real estate or the foundation, um, to help take care of. Did, did I answer your question? Yeah, absolutely. It, okay. it really sounds like, as you mentioned in your presentation, it's lessening the burden or it's helping share the burden, which right. hopefully is making it easier for another person to come into the store when, when the current business owners are ready to move on. Um, yeah, thank you. I see in the chat, we have a question from Stuart Reed, and this one I believe is for you, Jeannie. Um, how did you define your charitable mission in order to get 501c3 status? And um, I wonder if you can also kind of expand on the process that you went through uh, to get that status. Um, it sounds like it. it's not always an easy process. It took you a year to get 501c3 status. So I wonder if you could talk about that a little bit. Oh, and yeah. There now can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, we worked completely and totally with a lawyer to do the 501c3 status. And when we were first setting up the foundation, the, the immediate goal was the foundation would own the grocery store but the foundation can be and is going to be so much more than that. Um, we've got other plans um, to extend the walking trail on around the golf course and just um, beautify planes in different ways and make it more family friendly or inviting for people to move here. But our first goal was the grocery store and it has totally taken up all of our time. And, um, but eventually 
what our goal is eventually down the road, and we know this is going to take years, um, is that the grocery store makes enough money that it can funnel it back to the foundation. And then the foundation can use that for other projects in planes. And, and like I said, we've, we've got a lot of debt. Um, we got, we had, a, we've gotten a lot of grants, but um, we had to build, we had to build new. There was nothing available in planes when we started this. So we had to build new and it's been a good thing. I mean, the old store would have been almost as much to remodel as it did to cost this to, to get it put up. But um, that's what our goal is eventually is for the grocery store to be able to pay its own bills and maybe have a little extra and it goes into the foundation to help with planes. And we can just be self-sufficient. Um, and as far as um, how we made sure it was 501c3 status, we totally depended on the lawyer. And she asked questions after questions after questions. And she tried to cover absolutely anything that we would ever want to do in the future. She was really good. And the reason it took a year is because it sat on somebody's desk at the government for quite a while. It was just, she kept saying, it's just such a unique project that that IRS agent doesn't know what to do. And it did get, keep getting passed from one agent to another and that yeah it took it took a full year and so we kind of messed up her her saying her saying was um nobody had ever taken longer than six months and wow. we took a year so but yeah there's there's not much of anything in there that we can't do and be under the umbrella of this foundation except she said if you want to do any kind of bingo, she says, call me first. Uh, that's that's under gambling. And and she goes, there's you don't want to mess up your 501c3 status because you wanted to play bingo. Uh -huh. So so anyway, um I yeah. don't I probably did not answer your question. No, I think I think you did. And I think the fact that it took a year because essentially it doesn't seem like the, the IRS maybe has seen this a whole lot. It's kind of a unique project. Yeah, to have it, grocery we're store not the as only a, one in the United States, but we are one of the, one of the first mm -hmm. ones. We were copying a little bit off of Moreland, Kansas. And what the difference was with us and them is they already had a foundation in place. And the, our lawyer had worked with them also. Mm -hmm. But their foundation was already in place when she worked with them and things they would want to do, it, their, they couldn't do it and stay within the guidelines of the foundation. So she knew that she had with us, we got the benefit of her experience with them because then she, she knew that we had to include absolutely everything. And that's part of what, I mean, she was just so thorough. So. Yeah, a good takeaway, a good lesson learned is make yes. sure you have a good lawyer on your team. <laughs> Well, we have a question here um, from Elizabeth Pratt that I think goes to any one of you, whoever wants to jump in. What do you feel most sets you apart from other grocery options, including convenience and dollar stores? We are tw a 25 minute drive from big box stores. And while people say they wanna shop, shop local, we still worry that they will travel for lower prices. So how do you differentiate to overcome that? Whoever wants to jump in. I guess I can jump in for you. Um, what helped us the most was um, having so much uh, student driven products. Um, the parents love to see or grandparents love to see their child working at the store. And since we had classes down there, they would love to come see that. So that boosted our like getting the younger community to come in there so much, like they make TikToks and um, think like videos that I didn't even understand what they were because I am 42 years old and they just made it fun. Like they could sell a salad to someone where I wasn't reaching that community. And so everybody just 
is at our doorstep because we are um, hitting each group of the community. So we get the older group, the middle age group, and then the younger generations. So that's that's how we, and like our vendors, um, they're very um, like original. So that helped us. So we stick in and feature a vendor um, every week. And so a lot of people come from all over. We, we are trying to get everyone from 50 states. We have a map of the 50 states up and we're at like, I think 30 states. So we want to hit all of them. Well, word of mouth has helped with that. And then we implemented a class called Ag Academy in our elementary school. So it is like a special, like, so Ag Academy is where, or is the same thing as like our PE and our music and our um, art class. And so they learn a lot about animal husbandry and then the um, kit and then they learn about a lot in the greenhouse so the kids make those they learn how to can and then they tell like our local area and that's how we get a lot of our customers so just getting everyone involved yeah very community centered and unique product selection mm -hmm. Taryn did you want to jump in yeah, I think like with us, because we're we're kind of in the same um, deal. Uh, I think it was Elizabeth who asked that question um, here. So here in Bird City, we're about a 40 minute drive from Goodland, Kansas, which has a Walmart and uh, St. Francis, which is about 15 miles straight west of us has a Dollar General. They also have a grocery store over there and different places to eat out. So this is a conversation that we've actually had with um, the past owner and current owners of our grocery store and what they've done, um, which I, I find super unique and it's actually um, catching on is more of that convenience type food. So um, you know how you can go into Walmart and you can already buy things that are already prepped that are fresh. They're doing that here. So you can go in and you can pick up, you know, like, uh, they may have like gourmet burgers or like stuffed pork chops or, you know, like asparagus all ready to go that you can just come in, pick up, take home and, you know, cook and not have to think about um, any of that. So they've kind of started to uh, dabble in that sort of thing. And it, and it is taking off. I think it is being very, very beneficial. The other thing is, is cashing in on like those programs. Um, like I mentioned, you know, the um, K-State Extension Office uh, here locally, we uh, went in with the Simply Produce route. And with that, there was no other grocery stores in our area doing that. Our hub was here for pickup. So we had people coming from probably about a 30 mile radius around to come in for that Simply Produce pickup. And when that happened, you know, it was like, oh, I'm in a grocery store. I need to, you know, pick up milk and bread and whatever else. Um, which helps. So like bringing in those programs also help kind of boost, um, I guess, the grocery store in a way to where it's like, I don't have really the need or um, the frequency to drive further when I'm just, you know, coming here anyways. Yeah, so having, finding those unique partners as well. Great. Well, I want to go back to you, Amy and ask you if you could talk a little bit more about how the school board was involved initially in getting the store set up um, and how what is the school board's role today with the grocery store and what kind of decisions do they make? Looks like you're muted. <laughs> um, there we go. Our, I just need to start out by saying like our school board is very um, entrepreneurship mindset. They want our kids to have a vision for themselves. And with that being said, our school board believes that they are going to be hands off until they need to step in. And so far they, I mean, they're there to back us. We have, I have their personal phone numbers if I need something. But um, they believe our superintendent, as long as we're making, like, we're not making money, but we're helping other groups, then he's just, they're just going to let us go. And we have never, like, if we need a new roof, 
or need something replaced, they say at a certain amount of money, and I don't even know what that amount of money is. I think it's $10,000. Come to us. We will pay for it. But that's the only, like, if it's a big ticket item, you come to us. But if not, we're going to watch this thing just blossom. And that's exactly what it has done. Now, our superintendent gives loans out to students that want to start their own entrepreneurship business and then sell their product in our store. That has gone off well, like surprisingly well. And then they repay him and we just go on from there. So um, this has helped a lot with our fundraising groups because the cheerleaders and the basketball team and the football team never have enough money. And they're always trying to sell calendars or uh, fruit or vegetables. Well, they come in and sell it through the store and that has um, like taken care of every fundraising problem that we've ever had. So that's another way to look at it too is um, this can be a hub for all of your different groups that you have in the school district. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, this question could be for anyone here, um, but let's say somebody is interested in these models and they live in an urban area. Obviously, you all are in rural communities, but do you think that these models could be implemented in an urban area? Do you think that there would be any differences if it was implemented in an urban area or any different challenges that you might foresee? Might be a tricky question to answer <laughs> if you just don't have the experience uh, uh, implementing this in an urban area, so. I think that this, like, I think about like Wichita, um, cause that's the closest, largest city to us. Yes. And, um, I think it could be implemented within like their school district, like around their central office. And, um, I think if you have like the agriculture tied to it, like a, um, charter school, I think that you could sell a lot of products there and everybody loves the farm to table. So I think that would be a good resource if they want to start out small, just do like a farm to table, um, like a pop-up store. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Start uh, with uh, kind of a unique niche market right. at first. Okay, mm -hmm. great. All right. Well, we I think we have time for one more question. We just had a question come in from Jackie. Have you, any of you, been able to or thought about coordinating with other area regional grocers for easier or cheaper ordering, um, ordering storage or pickup? That's a challenge that a lot of grocers face. So yeah, uh, currently our grocery store, um, when Chris and Andrea took it over and even before then, uh, Brenda Johnson, who was the owner before, she started working with surrounding grocery stores because it was getting harder and harder to have trucks get out here and they didn't want to make as many stops. And so they're like, we just want one hub and then have all the other grocers, you know, come to this one hub to pick up their stuff and then they go out. Um, and we've, our grocery store has actually had experience in that. Chris and Andrea are currently doing that for however many grocery stores, I'm not sure, but I know at this time, I think it's for sure three other grocery stores that come up to our grocery stores. I'm not sure on the frequency, um, but there again, it was just due to, you know, trucks and either cost, um, you know, of that, like splitting the cost or um, the shipping uh, on stuff, I think was getting more difficult. And so there again, frequency of trucks went down um, I know when COVID hit, that's kind of where more of that mentality came of like that joining together, having the one pickup spot, uh, because out here with the shortage of truck drivers, it just, it was getting more difficult. So yeah, we've had a little bit of ex uh, experience. I'm not very knowledgeable on that, but I know that our grocery store has had experience with that surrounding and kind of creating themselves as that hub for this corner um, of our you know, state area. Great. 
Well, thank you. Um, I think that's all the time that we have now for questions. Um, so we'll just go ahead and do a quick wrap up here. Um, thank you, Amy, Jeannie, Taryn, for your time today and sharing your experience and your expertise with us. Um, before we let you go, we wanted to let you know that we have an opportunity for Kansas Rural Grocers. We're offering another round of the Grocery Business Transition Mentorship Program. And so that round is going to go from January 2023 until March 2023. And through this program, grocers and community leaders are paired with a mentor to help advance their projects. So the program participants get to receive in-depth, customized technical assistance on a range of topics, whatever whatever kind of assistance they're needing, whether it's creating a business plan, um, assessing markets, establishing a community-supported grocery store, and so on. Um, so if you're interested in joining this program, there's just a short application online to help us understand what your needs are. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and put a link to the chat, a uh, link to that in the chat so you can access that application and learn more about this program. Deadline is December 16th. Um, and then finally, as always, we have a, a short survey at the end where we would love to hear your feedback so that we can continue to improve our programming. I will put a link to the chat to that survey as well. And then finally, just a quick preview of the, the next webinar. Our final webinar of the series will be next month on December 15th. Um, this will be kind of our wrap up and recap where we will share some key takeaways um, that we have learned during the, the webinar series, as well as hear some lessons learned directly from grocers as well who have gone through a business transition. So we hope you you join us for that webinar. Um, once again, thank you to our presenters today, Amy, Jeannie, and Taryn. And thank you all for joining us. Um, hope you have a great afternoon. Take care.